Hi, everyone. My name is Olga Petrova, and uh, I'm a researcher at Avast for almost two years now. And uh, this is my colleague, Yuri Kasimov. Uh, hi, I'm Yuri Kasimov, and I'm also a researcher at, at Avast. Um, our talk will be more on the technical side of spectrum with uh, a little bit of machine learning here and there. So, let's start. Our goal today is to show you how we leverage AI and big data to burn malware. And to start a fire, you need a spark. So, uh, first, first part of presentation will be held by me, and uh, I will describe the malware research. It's the part what I'm working on, I'm focusing on. The second part will be taken by Yuri, and he will t talk about uh, anomaly detection, and he's also prepared a cool demo for you. But first of all, we would like to thank our big data system team in Prague and uh, all researchers and engineers which contributed to, to this work. And last but not the least, threat researchers and analysts without whom our work wouldn't be possible or even wouldn't exist. Avast is dedicated to creating a world that provides safety and privacy for all, no matter who you are, where you are, or how you connect. This is the main motto of our company. We are consumer-oriented and we have a large user base. We have more than 400 million users. Majority of them are using our antivirus on PC or Mac, and the rest are using our mobile solutions. And each month, Avast prevents around 1.5 billion malware attacks. It blocks more than five, uh, 500 million visits to malicious websites, and we collect and analyze 8 million samples. And for this, we are using three-step threat approach. So first step is to identify threat. The threat might be in a form of uh, executable file on Windows, or it can be also some website, phishing website. Second step is to block it. We, for executables or files, we usually deploy our uh, definition, virus definitions to our client, and by this, we are blocking the files on our client systems. And the third step is what we are doing with Yuri, is our day-to-day -day job. We are analyzing and automating the first and second step. And uh, our, I'm going to talk about malware classification. So since the beginning of Avast history, we were collecting and storing all executables fi executable files on our internal servers. And as you can imagine, it is a lot of data, actually more than 700 terabytes of data. To classify them with uh, classical machine learning methods, we use a principle of uh, divide and conquer. We are clustering, we are extracting first uh, static features from our samples, from binary files, and by static I mean uh, we are extracting features without executing this file, so for example, names of sections, uh, some flags in header, something like this, so it can be binary or float features. Then we cluster these files with the simplest possible algorithm k-means, and for each cluster we train a random forest classifier. Just to summarize uh, the problem we have, we have more than 500 handcrafted features from our threat researchers, experts, our task is to classify files uh, to clean malware or potentially unwanted program categories. And uh, as I mentioned, we use a two-step pipeline, cluster and then train random forest classifier. This, uh, on, the, on the left side, you can see an animation of Disney visualization of our clusters. And as you can see, we have a, a a lot of clusters are homogeneous. They contain only malicious samples, the red ones. Some of clusters contain only clean files, uh, the green ones. But 
as a data analyst or machine learning researcher, we were always interested in the origins of our data. So uh, on the right side, you can see a UMAP visualization of a small amount of data we have, the static feature space. We were interested in things like, is k-means even suitable for our data? Of course not. <laughs> what, is, what is the best clustering? Uh, what hyperparameters to choose? And uh, for this, I was always using Spark. And uh, during this journey, um, I came into a realization that I needed to re-implement the whole pipeline in Spark. But first, I would like to mention the, the architecture of our Spark cluster. So uh, we have a bunch of servers which, uh, cons which construct our uh, Spark cluster. Clients send us uh, events and we stream them through Kafka. Then we can stream them further to actual consumers. We can save them to HDFS. We can perform elastic search on the top of the data and we can calculate different metrics. And uh, what, what have been done? So uh, in the beginning of pipeline, we have uh, this uh, huge amount of data stored on servers. We extract features, perform clustering, and then do training. I've utilized the feature extraction step, and the rest were just several lines of code in Spark, as you can imagine. Um, I didn't mention the, the biggest problem. So we had this. Uh, this uh, top part, this was our old system and was super performant. It was tailor-made solution which, were, which was patented by our software engineers. It was optimized, but for me it was uh, impossible to perform any experiments because any change would require me to uh, write and test code in C++ and uh, any change would take months. So mm, now real world problems. Unlike our tailor-made k-means, uh, plain, uh, plain implementation of uh, Spark k-means outputted 20 mega clusters with uh, more than million samples in each. And of course, these uh, clusters did not fit into memory. So as low hanging fruits, we tried to adjust worker memory, of course, in Spark, adjust cores per executor. But if you can allow yourself, you can easily use the most simple trick and subsample data, which we were, which we were doing, essentially after. And I would like also to mention how we use Spark with uh, with Python in our uh, validation production feedback loop. Because when we train models, we cannot just simply push them into production. We actually need to track the performance of these models and uh, deploy only those which have the, higher, the highest accuracy. And uh, this is a schema of our validation production uh, pipeline. So first, when we train our models, we deploy them into silent mode and track their uh, responses, and we don't actually send anything to our clients. We store them to HDFS, and as soon as we have some data, we can, uh, we can compute performance metrics and output some graphs. And uh, we, we actually kind of stick to our uh, handcrafted solution when we output graphs in uh, PNG format from Matplotlib, Matplotlib, or we also utilized possibility to have uh, interactive graphs from Plotly. And this web and these graphs are served on a simple Flask web Flask based uh, web page. Just to summarize what we had, we had a optimized and performant uh, system. Any change, any experiment would take us months to develop, and uh, it was not good. And uh, we ended up implementing this pipeline in parallel in Spark. 
it is slower, but it's much easier to experiment with and allow us to ship fast uh, changes. So uh, Yuri is going to take the second part. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about anomaly detection on time series. Uh, so how do we get from uh, malware to time series? Uh, as my uh, colleague mentioned, uh, we de yes. Uh, as my colleague mentioned, we deploy uh, definitions of files to clients, and when some definition is triggered, it means uh, some uh, there is some malicious file, and when the file is detected, uh, we s the application sends uh, a report back to our backend saying, I detected uh, this malware with this name uh, from this family. And we have uh, thousands of detections per minute. Uh, I, I would like to show a small video. Let's hope it works. <coughs> so this is the map of uh, our honeypots. Uh, these are just computers which are somewhere all over the globe. And this map shows how these honeypots are contacted by things which are, are not supposed to contact uh, honeypots. And you can see that uh, there are a lot of different things happening all over the globe. And it's impossible for analysts to actually um, analyze it manually. There are so many reports, so many things hap are happening. So how can we help analysts to analyze uh, new emerging threats or new malware campaigns? We decided to try anomaly detection on time series. When we get reports, we group by them by detection name and time window. And we create a time series which is depicted here. It's just for one detection. Each point is, says, uh, we detected this uh, malware uh, during this time window so many times. And this time series is normalized, but we can have uh, 60,000 of detections per 15 minutes. And our goal is to say, OK, there is a, uh, here and here is an anomaly. Please take a look, check it. Uh, and our approach is the following. We take uh, input, uh, the input to machine learning model is uh, actual time series, the blue line here. And uh, machine learning model generates uh, predictions. It's uh, the rate curve. Then we assume that if there is a sudden change in uh, time series, the model will not be able to adjust fast to it, and the difference between the prediction and uh, real value will be much larger than average. And we mark these residuals, which are larger than normal, uh, as an anomaly. The problem is that we have thousands of different detections. We cannot do it with just one machine learning model. We need basically one LSTM per each time series. So our first idea was to create a, a custom streaming app as a proof of concept. Uh, we went with Python because it has nice machine learning frameworks and it's easy to code in it. Uh, but the big, big part of the, this proof of concept of this application was solving actually reading data from Kafka, aggregating, checkpointing, uh, and stuff that actually solved by uh, some applications. Uh, it was written by researchers, including me, and uh, it was working quite well, but it was not ready for production. We were not sure if it would be working stable o over a long period of time, and also, uh, it's difficult to experiment with this code. It's, it was quite a large amount of code. And also, it's not scalable. Yes, we did it for 200 time series. 
but we have th thousands. It's d difficult to s sc scale. So we united with our engineers and we started to s look for a road to heaven. And we found Spark Structured Streaming. It's not exactly heaven, but it's a very nice working API, which is clean and uh, quite easy to use. So I would like to describe some advantages of Spark Streaming, which we found during uh, our experimentations. Uh, the first advantage is a unified processing engine. And this is a huge feature for us, because uh, Spark Streaming was designed with the goal to unify streaming and uh, batch processing. It basically can build a bridge between a research department and engineering. Uh, engineers can build pipelines, getting data from Kafka, and the research department can work on uh, creating models, creating anomaly detectors, and then we just put blocks together and uh, it works. Uh, second advantage is uh, the time windows uh, work out of the box. For us it was huge. We work with time series, we need time windows. And uh, we can just specify interval of which we want for our models, and our models get only this amount of data. Also, Spark has built-in watermarking, which is used to deal with uh, late data. So a client sends a report, but for some reason there is huge la latency, and it arrives much later. And Spark can just deal with it, and it can assign it to uh, the window it belongs to, or discard it. Uh, the second, uh, the third advantage is end-to-end uh, -end pipeline. Uh, so when we work with big data, it's uh, uh, very expensive to recompute the results. We need to, and we want to send the results to researchers, to f some further processing, and we want to send it to analysts to report that there is some, some anomaly and we want to send it to um, some visualization to have some nice graphs. And Spark also allows us to do it. And the last but not least is uh, resilient streams. Uh, Spark uh, allows us to define uh, a checkpoint directory and it takes care of uh, uh, saving batch IDs, offsets, and if s for some reason our application fails, uh, we have a checkpoint, we can start from it, and we do not recompute anything. Uh, so after we uh, changed from uh, pure Python to PySpark, it was nice to see how more readable is our code. So on the left is our code before, and you cannot read it. It's a, a large amount of code. It's uh, very difficult to understand what's happening. And this is how it looks in uh, Spark. And you just read data from Kafka. Uh, you go to buy detection name and window. You count uh, occurrences of uh, some uh, malware. Then you apply uh, the, uh, machine learning models, generate predictions, then you apply anomaly detection and flash the results to something. Another advantage of Spark is uh, it allows parallel training. Uh, we have thousands of models. They're, they're not deep models. We can train them on CPU, but if we do it sequentially, it will take a large amount of time. And if you just distribute your uh, training jobs to different workers, we, you can have uh, hundreds of models at the same time. Also, uh, Spark was quite nice to work with, but there are some challenges. One of them is unexpected behavior. Uh, so for example, uh, I, when I was doing some experiments on my machine, it was not working. No errors, nothing. Just empty output. 
and same code on my colleague machine was providing results, which we expected. And we, we are still investigating why it happens because the, there is no any, nothing in logs, nothing in, no exceptions. So this and silent failures are quite big problems for us. Uh, so I would like to show how it looks like. Uh, I ran the code before and uh, the output can be, in this case, uh, I outputted uh, it to console. And it's just uh, detection name, some date, uh, predicted value, uh, actual value, and uh, uh, if it's anomaly or not. And the code to do that looks like this. So it's almost the same thing which I showed in the slide with some additions such as watermarking. And we also add uh, uh, models which we trained before and saved to Parquet file. Uh, but for example, uh, you want to read from uh, Parquet file. So Uh, you can easily, this is how you read from Parquet file, and this is how you read from Kafka. You can very easily switch between these two, uh, uh, two options, and you don't need to write a lot of code. Uh, okay, so uh, the takeaways. Uh, Spark stru structured streaming allows very easy collaboration between science and engineering teams. It was very easy to collaborate with uh, our engineer Joao. He was writing uh, one part, I was doing di different parts at the same time. Very easy. Uh, it's a very nice toolbox to do anomaly detection in real time on time series. There are a lot of built-in features and it allows very good parallelism on uh, when training the models. Uh, thank you, and if you have any questions, we will answer. Any question? No? Or, or do we really need antivirus on Mac? <laughs> <laughs> that was the question. <laughs> yeah, I have one. <laughs> because it was pre-installed in my machine. But actually, I think, I think yes. Mac is still targeted. Can you provide some details on or, or examples you you met during your work? Oh, uh, on Mac threats. Yeah, you mean. exactly. Well, to be honest, uh, I work with uh, mo mostly with uh, Windows executables, so uh, this is probably our main focus. Mm, I cannot think of any uh, threat, but I can imagine that uh, some ransomware can easily can easily run on Mac. And uh, for this, you need an antivirus to block it. Thank you. Next question. Uh, yeah, I understood that uh, with the Apache Spark. Can you please speak louder? Able to hear now? So I uh, I read that uh, with Apache Spark it was a little slower. So so could you please like explain in a little more detail like mm -hmm. the the environment on which your Spark is running and is it in cloud or you know the specifications and what was your sample size and you said like you again uh, deducted the sample size. So I would be more interested in like the, the configuration the runtime environment for the Spark. Okay, uh, we have uh, four. Uh, thousand cores on our cluster 
and the uh, amount of data was uh, 450 million samples. And uh, the deal is that uh, on our tailor-made k-means, we have used, uh, it, is, it is well distributed, so uh, I think, hmm? well distributed. So when, when, you, when you are doing so, so something on Spark, you partition your data and uh, actually it, be, it may become slower when uh, you partition them incorrectly. And uh, the latency from communication between workers can affect. I think this was main reason. And uh, other reason is uh, that our, so the thing is that only k-means part was, uh, was slower. The random forest training was actually faster because we used this parallelized pandas UDF uh, training. K-means, uh, I believe it was, it was optimized several times by our um, by by our software engineers, and that's that's why it uh, that's why it was uh, quicker. Okay. Next question. Okay, I can't see any questions. Thank you.